evening, good afternoon. We are waiting for all participants who were in the waiting room to join us. To connect. If you have not chosen interpretation, please do so now. Si no ha seleccionado interpretación, por favor, háganlo ahora. Bien. Buenos días, buenas tardes. Very good. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Our Pan American course on resilient health systems. Today, we are going to have our session for integrating health equity into efforts to address climate change. Please select the interpretation so you can listen in your desired language. As you know, this course has two weekly sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we will be working together until May 3rd. These are the two sessions for this week. We invite you to join the course in the link provided. Please remember that your attendance will be checked when you log in using the link that you receive when you enroll in the course. Please remember that we have 90 minute sessions and we will be together today for one hour and a half. At the end of the session, you will have the chance to ask questions in the Q&A se section below. These sessions are being recorded and will be uploaded within 24 hours in the course website. And the links for other materials such as slide decks will also be provided in that same website. Today we have a stellar panel with Carlo Farreon Guzman from the Planetary Alliance for Health for the Harvard School of Public Health, Vivian Camacho, General Director of the Ministry of Public Health of Bolivia. I will uh, present all of them further when they do their own presentations. Um, John Balbus from the Office of uh, Interim Director of the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, um, Baltica Cabezas, Professor of Social Epidemiology. And now we're going to start with Carlo Farreon Guzman, who will discuss with us today integrating health equity into efforts to address climate change. He is associate professor of Global Health University of Maryland. He is a researcher from the director of the Inter-American Center for Global Health, the first global health hub in Central America and seeks to redefine the meaning of leadership and global health through innovative educational approaches. He began his career as a primary care doctor in a rural area of Costa Rica, working with closely with migrant and indigenous populations. His work follows a health equity and human rights framework as a guiding principle and firmly believes in progress in health through community empowerment. Thank you so much for being with us and please go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Irene, so much. I'm going to start 
saying hi in Spanish. English, although my native tongue is Spanish, I understand that most of you or the common language among the people attending this course is in English. So I'll do that and um, I'll maybe throw around some Sp Spanglish just in case. So to the interpreters, um, I'm sorry from 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 the beginning, uh, it will be a little bit Spanglishy uh, during and throughout. So beware. Um, all right, so I put my alarm. I have 30 minutes to introduce you to the framework of equity and how we use it in climate change. And I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Um, you should be able to see my screen by now. Uh, and um, so when when I got the invitation, I want to tell you that when I got, got the invitation uh, to attend this course, uh, getting a little bit of, of context around what the course is and for who it's from, uh, hospital administrators, uh, healthcare professionals, emergency planners, public health officials. Um, and the goal, of course, is according to what I heard from, from the organizers, is to uh, provide you all with the knowledge and tools needed to prepare for climate change. Now, equity per se is not a tool, right? It's not something like a, a program or a, a, a given tool that you can go and apply. It's more of a lens. And throughout this conversation, I want to be able to apply this lens with you and see how climate change through the lens of equity is affecting um, uh, uh, different populations around the world. Uh, and it just I, I always like to start with, as an educator that I am, and I consider myself first and foremost an educator, I always like to be able to start by providing the clarity on what is it that we're trying to achieve. In this case, I'm putting in front of you the, the course objectives, which you are all aware of by now. But within these course objectives, I want to kind of focus on the one that is in italics and boldened, which is apply a health equity lens into efforts to address health system decarbonization and climate resilience. So this is what we're going to focus on today. Today's talk for the next 28 minutes now, uh, we're going to focus on this health equity lens. Now, just a note on language uh, here, right? There are two terms that are used in health uh, and in global health and in health systems uh, jargon, which is these two terms, equality and equity. Now, I bet most of you have seen that famous slide of the, the little kids watching the, the baseball game and the boxes, which are the resources distributed, be it equally or inequitably, right? And in Spanish, igualdad y equidad, or igualdad y equidad, right? Those are the two words in 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 Spanish that sometimes as well get thrown around a, and, and are equated sometimes to be the same thing. Just to say that in global in health and in health in general, when we talk about equality, we're talking about the distribution of resources, no matter what the outcome is. Distribution of resources that is equal for everyone without taking into consideration the outcomes, right? And, and you think of the three boxes and that's kind of where you are. When we're talking about equity, right? We're talking about a specific outcome, right? But beyond that image that you're thinking of with the three boxes and the little kid watching the, the baseball game, right? When we talk about distribution of resources and equity, right? And fair outcomes for all involved, we must also take into consideration other things that come into the image. Things like the starting point of that person, right? The, um, the barriers or the fence in that image that I'm talking about, right? And I should have put up this image. I, I decided not to do it last minute because I didn't include it in my original. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, what I'm talking here is that when we're thinking of equity, we got to think of the context as well, what the end goal is, who considered that end goal. And when we're applying the equity lens within climate change, the equity lens must be applied not just to the outcomes, as I'm just saying, right? But it must be applied to the analysis of the underlying drivers that are leading to climate change. We must apply it as well to understanding how the impacts uh, of climate change are affecting different populations. And we also must apply the equity lens in the way we design solutions. So this three-prong approach requires us to go beyond that image, beyond that outcome, beyond the desirable outcome, which is in that image watching the baseball game. But we must think of equity in climate change when we are analyzing underlying drivers. And this will make more sense when we start looking at the images, understanding the impact on different populations, and the way we design solutions. And so I just want to make that clear that we're going to be applying the equity lens 
right into those three. Now, another important uh, thing to, to, to bring up is when we are talking about inequities, right, and inequalities, again, those are the application of these terminology into differences in outcomes, right? So we're saying an inequity is when we find a difference between two populations, in this case, a health difference or a health outcome difference between two populations, which we are deeming to be unfair, unjust. When we say that there's an inequality, right, we are deeming that difference, we're not putting a moral judgment in it. So that is the difference of when, when we say inequity, we are putting a moral judgment that something is unfair and, and, and unjust. For example, life expectancy of indigenous populations in one country might be lower than life expectancy of non-indigenous populations in that same country. And that the difference between the non-indigenous and the indigenous, we are deeming to be unfair, right? We're putting a moral judgment in that difference and we call that an inequity. If we are saying, oh no, that's fair, right? There, there, is, no, there is no reason to believe that this is an immoral thing, then we say that's an inequality, inequality, right? So those terminologies are used a lot and it's important to go back to that definitions. So how do we understand then how a, a health equity and climate change are connected, right? And I wanna kind of just th throw out there some models that you've probably already encountered throughout the course and that you will continue to encounter. I'm not gonna stop and explain these because I'm sure uh, other people in this panel are gonna, are gonna be uh, patient enough to explain what's going on here. And as well, I'm already pretty sure that you've seen some of these in the previous sessions that, we, that we've done. What I wanna say here, right, is that all of these are in essence saying the same things, which is there's a bunch of factors that are influenced by climate change. And all those factors that are influenced by climate change that eventually impact health, right? Be it the, your environmental exposure, be it your level of resilience, be it the amount of risk you're exposed to, be in your genetic burden, those are all, right? And they can fall all under what we call the determinants of health, right? And across the broad board here, I'm pretty sure you've all seen these graphs and I'm not gonna detain myself on what we do. These are all, the, these are just reinterpretations of the same determinant of health concept, whether we call them structural, proximal, distal, whether we're doing what we call an ecological model here, right? Or an onion layer model, which is this one, the dog green, or where we're doing a, a flow chart, which is, would be this one, right? In which here the distal or the structural is to your left, right? In this one, the distal or the structural is on the top, right? And the proximal is more in these areas, right? So all these are reinterpretations of, uh, of, of the determinants of health model. Now, a lot also has been said, and we're starting to call these determinants of health model different. And you know about now the social determinants of health, the ecological determinants of health, the commercial determinants of health. It's important to try not to separate them because they're all interlinked and they're all happening at the same time. These models of climate change and health, right? What they are, are a direct interpretation of how climate change affects the determinants of health and hence then impacts health outcomes. So this is another model that I like to use when I'm explaining the determinants of health in which a, a, we understand health, right? And my understanding of health that I wanna share with you is that health is nothing but a product of a diverse dynamic interdependent eco-social system, right? And that eco-social system is what we see in this graph here in which we have all the determinants of health floating in this milieu Right, then what you see here, these connective tissue of society and ecological and different uh, 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 things that are happening in our context, right? This milieu is where all the determinants of health are happening simultaneously, right? They're happening uh, in, in an interconnected fashion. And the weight that each of these take is gonna depend on who you are, where you are, and when you are, right? And that is to say that the makeup of the determinants of health model might change from person to person, from geography to geography, and from time to time, 
right? And it is important to note then that all these are interacting in different ways, sometimes unpredictable, sometimes known to us, sometimes unknown to us, and they interact in order to produce whether a good health outcome or a bad health outcome. So health becomes this end process or this end product, I mean, of this process, which is a combination of, a, of this eco-social system. And what climate change does then, right? Climate change, as, as put as from the, the, the kind of the first military reports back in the 90s, what was the threats to climate change is that climate change is what we call a threat multiplier, right? All these things that are included within the phenomenology of climate change in the systems, uh, the change in the, our climatic systems, increasing temperatures, precipitation in increases, sea level rise, biodiversity loss, desertification, land degradation, all what they do, right, and how they impact all the determinants of health, right, it has ripple effects throughout the determinants of health. And this is why I use this image, this, Im this image here of these circles here, right? I call that reverberance, right? Tiene una resonancia. It, it resonates throughout the whole ecosocial system in order to change the makeup of these determinants of health and hence give a different, right, health outcome, right? And this is why this is a gauge kind of very dynamic, moves up and down depending on the combination of these determinants and of this. So climate change as a concept, as a, as a systems changer, right, is what we call a threat multiplier. It reverberates throughout the whole system. And it's important to note, right, that climate change does not happen in a vacuum, right? Climate change is a symptom of a larger syndrome of global environmental changes, or I should say anthropogenic global environmental changes, that is human caused changes to Earth's natural systems that are happening simultaneously. Now, climate change is over here, but it's also happening simultaneously with global pollution, right? Biodiversity loss, altered biogeochemical cycles, especially the cycle of nitrogen and phosphorus, thanks to the heavy use of fertilizers, in our uh, food system, land use and land cover change. We're talking about here desertification. We're talking about deforestation. We're talking about land use change for large scale agriculture to feed animals and to feed ourselves. We're talking about resource scarcity, basically what we, uh, uh, the, the, the scarcity of fresh water. And we're talking as well as biophysical ocean changes. That is the ocean that is becoming more acidic. It's becoming more warm. It's becoming more full of pollution and sediment. Now, all these elements, you see climate change is just one of them, is happening interconnectedly. This is the planetary health framework that I use and that we use at the Planetary Health Alliance in order to explain how these ecological drivers are affecting changing patterns of disease, right? And when you look at all the information that's in the middle over here, right, what this is, is just the determinants of health frameworks, right, trying to analyze the pathways by which these uh, interconnected phenomena, right, of these ecological drivers are, in, are leading towards changes in things like infectious disease, non-communicable diseases, nutritional diseases, mental health patterns, and reproductive and, and sexual health, right? So the, 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 the planetary health frameworks allows us to understand climate change in this larger context of global environmental change and trying to elucidate the pathways by which these changes are leading to changing patterns of disease, and then be able to use those understandings in order to try to create solutions that are equitable and that can change these systems, the system, these systems pathways that then are leading to global environmental change. Irene, I see that your camera is on and mic's on. Do you have a? Yeah, because you're running out of time. I have a 30 minutes. Oh, sorry. I thought it was 15. So sorry. Okay, so going back to my slide, and again, I'm trying to make sense of all of this um, for you. Uh, uh, when we talk about equity, again, and this is just to reemphasize, this is not a mistake. We are talking when we're applying the lens of equity throughout the uh, impacts of climate change and health. We're looking at the equity in how we analyze underlying drivers, that is, the things that are causing the changes in the determinants of health. Right, we are trying to apply the equity lens in understanding the impacts of different populations. That is how climate change is impacting different populations differently and why it's leading to different health outcomes. 
and why those are unfair, and when we're applying the equity lens into the way we design solutions to make sure that our solutions are not harming the most vulnerable, but also that the way we lift up people to become more resilient to the risks that they're being exposed and to reduce their level of vulnerability is done in a fair and just manner, right? And when we look at why we should do this, right, and why we should apply an equity lens into uh, uh, climate change and health, we look at the level of vulnerability around the world and how many people or how vulnerable are people around the world to climate change. And this is a vulnerability index score. You don't know have you don't have to know exactly how to calculate it. And I'm just going to tell you that this is a composite index that combines things like food security, like water availability, health and living conditions, ecosystem services and infrastructure, including energy. And it combines all those things to see where there's more vulnerability around the world. The ones in gray is that there's missing information, cannot be calculated. But if you draw a line around the tropics, you more or less will tend to see that the countries that are in the tropical regions, right, are the most vulnerable. That is both social, political, and geographical. Those two things are coming together in that in, in this risk factor. But also there is the economic capacity. There is also the social and political capacity to be able to fence off climate change. So when we look at this, obviously these are countries that are also considered LMICs when it comes down to income. And that is in part feeding that level of vulnerability in uh, 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 these, these countries. So these are the countries, right, that are more vulnerable. But when you look at who is producing, right, who or who is driving the climate crisis, uh, and when you look at the largest pollu polluters around the world, you see that obviously the largest economies are the ones that are polluting the largest. Of course, there's a direct correlation and there's still not clear decoupling around the world between economic systems and economic growth and uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Now, some countries have said that they've managed to do that and decouple, but the honest truth is a lot of those countries are just exporting their a, a, a greenhouse gas emission footprint to elsewhere, mostly countries in the global south. When you look at then the level of vulnerability versus the level of uh, greenhouse gases that are emission, and this is uh, um, total emissions, um, and these are cumulative emissions throughout history. Right now, China is the biggest emitter per year uh, total, uh, but cumulatively, that is throughout history, who has emitted more? USA is still leading those charts. Now, obviously this is very different, right? That is the people that emit are not the ones that have the highest vulnerability. Now we must ask then, is this a fair uh, outcome, right? And in Espanol, we say, usted se come la piña y a mí me duele la panza, right? And I'm going to translate to English, won't make sense, a lot of sense, but you eat the pineapple, but I get the tummy ache, right? And this is something that seems to be happening in this, right? That the countries that are emitting the most are the ones that are not suffering the consequences the most, or it's at least not yet, right? And this graph, it's a what we call a goodie, but oldie, although not yet updated, basically brings that point home. In the top is uh, uh, it, it's, it's a cartograph. This is what we call a cartograph, in which the size of the country, right, it, it is a sign of the size of emissions. That is the largest, the larger country, right? The larger the country is you, in, in this in this graph, the more a, the more a global health a, a, a greenhouse gas emissions in this top one. And here is related mortality due to that a greenhouse gas increase globally. As you can see, the people that eat the pineapple, so to speak, right, are not, are not the ones suffering the tummy ache, right? In this case, we're talking about mortality. Of course, this is a really, really severe indicator, but I just want to kind of use that analogy as, as something that some of my Spanish speaking a, a colleagues might be aware of. Now, thinking about this in another way, right, when we look at how climate change can drive inequitably around the world, certain things that can then lead to other subsequent challenges, such as migration, we see that climate change obviously is going to push within countries, right, within countries that are the most vulnerable, 
the populations that are more vulnerable in those countries are the ones that are most likely going to be displayed. And this is a play, right? This is a play on the total amount of risk that someone is being exposed, right? In addition to the amount of resilience that this person is, is able or this community is able to have, right, minus the amount of vulnerability, right? When you do that equation in which you have risk, vulnerability, and resilience, and those things don't add up appropriately, you're going to start seeing massive amounts of large displacements. Now, just to say that these numbers here are in kind of status quo scenarios and very negative scenarios in which by 2050, we don't do much. Of course, we are not on track right now to meet our, the Paris Accord. We're not on track to meet 1.5. We're likely not on track to meet 2.0. And this means that some of these numbers, although hopefully won't be as high, might be high. Maybe not the exact numbers that you're seeing here, but displacement and climate uh, change related migration will continue to be a growing trend. And it's important that our health systems are prepared for this, whether we are a passing, a country where, where, where migrants are passing, such as the case of Costa Rica, or a country that is receiving, or a country that is exiling, right? In which the country, in which people are migrating. We must think of this as one of the great displacers of this coming century. Now, when you think of the concept of risk, a, a vulnerability, resilience, Right and how that plays out in different in different a, a contexts. I have an example here for you in which, to the left, you have a a, 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 a picture of um, a, the Netherlands, right? In which, it, of course, the Netherlands, as you know, half of it, half of the total territory of the Netherlands is under under a sea level uh, that is under zero meters above sea level, and they are at risk of, of, of sea level rise and they might lose some of their terrains. Of course, you know, the Netherlands is building huge dikes and has dedicated to build huge dikes throughout the centuries. And they're experts in this. They have a lot of resources, a lot of engineering capacity. They have the will and they have the political will and they have the economic resources to produce these things. So to your left, it's a, it's a prototype a, a house that floats depending on the level of the sea. So it does not need uh, to consider if sea level rises half a meter, one meter, because it basically, whatever it does, it will be able to float and the house will be able to maintain. Now, if you look to your right, some of the communities in the global south, and this could be, it could well be Panama, it could well be Brazil, it could be well South Asia, some of these, it could be well Timor. These images are very familiar to the people that live in the global south. Uh, and I've seen, this is not a picture of mine, but. Of course, when you think about the level of vulnerability, resilience, and a, a, a risk exposure, obviously the communities of the global south are going to have a harder time adapting, right? Fencing off those sea level rise as a consequence of global ch climate change, which is different than how communities in the global north are fencing these off. So that is something to consider when we are designing, right? When we are analyzing the the drivers, when we are analyzing the impacts and when we are analyzing the solutions, we need to use these equity lens uh, throughout, right? And one of the impacts that is gonna be more, more uh, evident, right? And it's gonna be more evident for populations living in high risk and high vulnerability and with little resilience is regarding on how climate change will affect people's diets. It's not just uh, they will lose their crops, right? Because of a changing patterns of, 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 of climatic conditions, such as extreme droughts or extreme precipitations, the extremes will become more common. But there are other things that are emerging in science. This is what we do in planetary health. We try to make those connections of the unknowns in order to bring these forward to make better policy decisions. So one of these things is how CO2 greenhouse gases is affecting uh, the quality of the micronutrients. Now, it's, climate change is not just affecting the quantity of crops that can be produced or the level of, of, of crops that are at risk of being lost due to drought or flooding, right? But the actual CO2 in the air, right? The higher it gets, surprisingly, the lower the quality of the micronutrients we find in food, right? And those are micronutrients that are vital for human well being, such as zinc, iron, and protein. And when you think about these, right, these are percentages of decrease. These are three, 5% in high CO2 scenarios, 
right? We're talking about 450 parts per million, 500 parts per million, depending on the study and where you read it. But when you think about that, right, a 5% to 7% might not sound that much, but when you have communities around the world that are living on the brink of malnutrition or already exposed to malnutrition, be it an uh, iron uh, deficit anemia or be it uh, immune deficiency, right? When you take these five, seven, six, seven, ten percent off their micronutrients quantity, they fall at higher risk, and that risk is not linear risk. That is accumulative risk that might then have dire consequences in the form of another infectious disease like malaria, another infectious disease like tuberculosis, another infectious disease like HIV, and these are cumulative effects, right? So these are important to understand in conjunction, not in isolation, and this is why we use, and I, I was a, a, having you a, a understand better the planetary health framework. And again, the combination of these with other social political factors is important to understand when analyzing equity. It's not just that there will be less crops. It's not just that those crops will have less micronutrients, that, that is, there will be less more nutrition. But these factors will then combine with other social political factors, right? That will cause then the access to these foods, these vital staple crops around the world to be less and less. That is because of price increase. That is because of the difficult of getting a, 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 a quality storage due to the different uh, climatic conditions that might emerge, emerging uh, pests that might come due to climate change. All those things combine to a scenario in which people's access to the food will be lessened, especially those that are most vulnerable. And talking about populations that are vulnerable, of course, there's a lot of evidence out there on things around how maternal health is being affected, how child health is being affected. And I'm not going to go over those. Those are accessible in the literature. And I think most of you are aware of how a, a populations that are deemed or have been deemed vulnerable throughout most of our countries, like newborns, like the unborn, like the maternal, uh, like the uh, carrying mother, are now starting to understand that climate change, increasing temperatures, dietary changes, migration, displacement, all those things are now having a huge impact. Now, how do we chart this into the future, right? How do we understand then into the future? Uh, what, what's going on now? In this graph, I want you to pay attention, and I'm almost done here. I have uh, four more minutes. Uh, in this graph, what I want you to see here is that this graph has two axes. One is the degree of environmental change here, and we might just call this climate change for the sake of this talk, right? The degree of climate change from left to right, little, a lot, right? And then relative health gain and relative health losses in the y-axis. We have two populations here graphed, and this is just a theoretical exercise, just to show you that right now, what is happening around the world is that the populations that have more power, that is the populations that have access to technology, populations that have a political voice, populations that have access to economic and knowledge resources, populations around the world, despite the fact that there is climate change and climate change is worsening, their health is actually getting better, right? And that might be you, me, the people that are sitting in this room, people that are in, in middle income countries that are of middle income, high income, but it also means people that are of high income countries that are of high, right? It's important to understand that the differentiation that we make within climate change literature that is that people are global south, global north, the Caribbean, the small island nation states. It's just one way to understand power dynamics that is very unidimensional, right? Whether it's income, whether it's developed, developing, whether it's global north, global south, whether it's a, a minorities or majorities, whether it's a, a people of color or people of European descent, that is still very unidimensional. We must understand the, these power dynamics actually add up, right? And again, power is a multidimensional concept and we must consider gender, income, education, age, migration status, nationality, sexual orientation, social capital, race, ethnicity. All these things must be considered, right? When we are analyzing power because within our own lower and middle income countries, within our own lower and middle income countries, there are populations that are of low power. So when you graph this out, this is not rich countries 
poor countries, this is populations with more power, and those are all around the world in all countries, these populations with less power. That is, populations with less power are already seeing health losses. Populations with high power, right, are seeing health gains paradoxical, and that's what we call the ecological paradox. But tipping points will be reached. I won't go into what tipping points are. I'm pretty sure you've already seen them. But when they are, right, and this is today in this graph, when they do reach, we will start see seeing decreases in global well-being from everyone, even populations with more power. I'll stop there just to say and give a shout out to uh, this is the model that we should that I want to advocate for. This is a model in which we seek that our goals as humanity land in this green space that Kate Raworth calls a safe and just space for humanity, in which we respect this ecological ceiling. We don't overshoot our resources to a point that endangers us, but we also don't undershoot to a place where we can't secure the minimal, viable, dignified conditions from everyone all around the world. I'm one minute over, I apologize. Thank you for that. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Carlos. No, yo me disculpo porque... Thank you, Carlos. Eh, I'm sorry because I didn't uh, keep track of the time. So now we have Vivian Camacho. Thank you for joining us. She's a director of medicine of the Ministry of Health of Bolivia. She's a commissioner and uh, She's a coordinator of the Ministry of Health in Bolivia, and representative of the movement for the health of peoples, former director of traditional medicine of the vice ministry of ancestral medicine of the Ministry of Health of the Plurinational State of Bolivia. She's a Quichua midwife. She promotes respected midwifery as she promotes the uh, health of uh, peasant women and also she's part of the network of communication of indigenous women and she also has studied agroeconomics and she's also specialized in interculturality and health focused on ancestral knowledge of uh, indigenous uh, peoples today she's going to talk about traditional ancestral medicine and social participation building uh, health in Bolivia. I think you're muted. Thank you. Greetings from Bolivia. Greetings to all of you. The speaker is uh, speaking in Quichua. I belong to Quechua Nation of the Plurinational State of Bolivia, and today I'm grateful for this invitation to be part of this speech supporting uh, Cambridge University's education session, and uh, I'm also grateful for listening to the other speakers. I'm going to give you this presentation to remind you of the social construction of health to uh, be able to read it in Spanish. Uh, so I am the National Director of Ancestral Medicine here in Bolivia, and I am part of our health ministry because we have a, a national law which uh, promotes the, the health, uh, traditional health. This law recognizes the wisdom of our ancestors, uh, spiritual guides, midwives, um, ancestral healers uh, of different specialities. And we are building this uh, integral health resilient system as well. Uh, for us, uh, we are struggling for uh, recognizing health as a human right, not as a business, because we have uh, faced the, the situation during pandemic COVID se session, the worst uh, time during the beginning of the pandemic session. It was uh, awful uh, to see human beings treated as a merchandise if you wouldn't have uh, money, you wouldn't get attention. That was the worst scenario ever. But also we recognize this as a human right. That's why we struggle for and also healthy food as a human right because we don't, uh, we don't have any health uh, if we don't have healthy food. And this should be 
um, recognized and guaranteed by the status. Uh, the different countries uh, from the state should guarantee these uh, rights for people. And also we are, talk we, are talk we are talking about social health determination, which means dignity and social justice for our people. Um, we don't talk about the uh, determination, uh, so social determinants, because it's not a list, a checklist. We talk about the process of building health, which has to do uh, with um, um, living conditions, with working conditions. If you have uh, food, if you have shelter, if you have a life without racism, without violence, is part of the building of health, the social building of health. And what health are we talking about? And not only a macrocultural dominant health, which has been imposed in our territories with genocide and taking our land more than 500 years ago. We are talking about the health that recognizes our um, cultural identities, but also recognizes who we are, it also recognizes us um, as part of the health systems, but from our main uh, roots, from our culture, from um, our cosmovision, and also from remembering that we belong to Mother Earth. That's why it is very necessary for us to remember our sacred places, our sacred uh, symbols um, that build us health. For us, uh, ancestral medicine takes care of us integrally, mental, physical, and spiritual, but also takes care of the territory, of the sacred um, land, of the sacred water resources, water fountains. For us, it's mother water, it's mother earth. They take care of us as well. So we need to remember that we come from these ancient traditions, which are millenary cultures. So we come from millenary wisdom, and we are still alive because of it. Um, this picture it was taken in Panama Channel in 1920, approximately. Those were the uh, indigenous doctors, Callawaya. They were sent to uh, Panama Channel to heal malaria, terciana, uh, to heal this. And if you remember, for um, we, we have a kinakina, so we have chloroquina to treat malaria now. So our ancestral indigenous wisdom has been taking care of, of us centuries of resistance. That's why we are still alive because we wouldn't have any doctor around before. But also it has to do with our ceremonies. It has to do with our way of living and being in the world. Not only use, um, when you say natural medicine, you use instead of the pill, you use a plant. It's, it's not only that, that, that is uh, making this another merchandise. We are talking about the integral view of health, which has to do with taking care of life integrally. If people have a healthy food, healthy water, healthy air, they will have health. Otherwise, it's not possible. That's why we talk about take, taking care of uh, integral. Our ancestral medicine takes care of animals, human beings, sacred places. We are living cultures alive with our own wisdom alive. And we need to go beyond um, um, economic domination, which has to do with capitalism, mer mer mercantilization. M merchandising of health has become that awful situation that we have suffered during COVID pandemic, but with many people that wouldn't have anything to eat, but also billionaires, tri trillionaires increasing their resources. So literally corporations are feeding themselves um, thanks to the debt and the illness of humanity. That's why we need to denounce this and transform this. And that's why we talk about the dialogue uh, between um, our medicines between Western conventional medicine and traditional ancestral health medicine. And go beyond this, go is, is looking for social justice for everyone. Because as ancient indigenous peoples, we have suffered not only historical racism, but also historic uh, um, injustice. And we are not talking only social justice, but also epistemic justice. And it has to do with a respect for our wisdom as well, because diversity makes us grow. Diversity protects life. The diversity of thought, diversity of production, takes care of biodiversity, cultural diversity, takes care of biodiversity. And it has to do with the tender care and solidarity and reciprocity that have, has taken care of us 
which is part of our ancestral medicine. It has to, to do with the equilibrium, with good thought, good heart, good action. And it has to do re remembering that we, we don't own Earth. Earth is not a resource. We belong to her. She is our mother. She is Mother Earth Pachamama. And it has to do with our ancestral roots. To whom do we want to look, for, look, look like? Uh, aren't we showing that we are enough for living, for dressing, for eating, for healing? It has to do with questioning that system that is killing Mother Earth, which is capitalism, which is neoliberalism. It's not humanity. It's not each of us killing Mother Earth. It's that mercanta, mercantilization. Is that absolute thought that everything has a price. No, our lives are priceless. Every little creature that is being extinguished by contamination, by pollution is priceless. That's why we struggle for all life, not only for human life, but also for whole life on earth. Mother earth in, your, in yourself, our life is reborn. Our life is turned on, turned off. We are your body, you are, you are your life. So we need to remember that she is taking care of us. We are part of her, her sacred cycle. The, the cycle of seeding, of harvesting, everything has ceremonies inside our communities and it has to do with equilibrium, taking care of Mother Earth to remember that we come from her. We are her seeds. We are the most beautiful dream of our ancestors alive. That's why we struggle for to remember this. And if we don't do this together, there's no way that humanity could survive. It's absolutely absurd to think that you are going to pay to buy one liter of air, healthy air to breathe. And even we, we know that there are corporations that are selling water. I come from Cochabamba. We are the only place that have taken away, struggling on the streets against corporation that wanted, wanted to privatize our water. So it has to do with the struggle of our rights. And also it has to do to, with remembering that the prayers of our ancestors, our own indigenous spirituality preserves us to be strong enough to resist. As our, our, um, our first professor, professor mentioned, the global South is suffering. We are the poor ones in the world. We are not the ones destroying earth. It's the neoliberalism, capitalism, the greedy, the greedy ones destroying this. But we are struggling, resisting with our ancestral wisdom, saying that we need to heal all together. We need to survive all together, taking hands, taking hands and resources. And I have learned it from communities in Chiapas. Healthy is a vida, a life without injustice, without humiliation, a heart, a only heart, a um, united community. It comes from the equilibrium with our um, campesino people, with peasants, with people that take care of earth. In Bolivia, we have made those advantages. We have lost before we were a vice minister. Now I am the national director. And it has to do with complementing ancestral ways with uh, Western ways. It has to do with um, dialogue of wisdom between both of them, being solidarity, um, sharing what we are. I am part of uh, Alma Ata, um, uh, not, not declaration, but the 40 years Alma Ata, a high level commission. And we have positioned this in, inside this document. We worked it in 2018. So without health of Mother Earth, there were, won't be health for anyone. And during COVID session, we have made this document in Latin America and Caribe, uh, how examples of our indigenous communities taking care of themselves uh, because they wouldn't have any other solution, but we have historically our herbs, our ceremonies, this wonderful example I give you is about Shipibo Conibo people, very sacred songs. They, they have sung to the heart of people, so they want to survive and they want to live. So it's about remembering that life is a sacred force as well. And we need to preserve this, no matter how, how, how great the destruction is, because we know the ones that are going to be most affected are the poor ones in the global South, and especially our indigenous communities. And as a midwife, I want to preserve this for you to remember that we need to build communities that take care of life. We need to remember that community life, agroecology, dignity in life, 
is the time of flowering of our people. It's the time of beginning of a new time because now we can share our voices, our thoughts that before were prosecuted and murdered. So I belong to that people that have uh, uh, given their lives so we can go on and uh, promoting the complementarity between different medicines, different wisdom to promote the production and reproduction of life, the organization of power, popular power, power inside communities to survive, to have health inside territories, to go a, a promoting research on sober, sovereignty in health with our uh, wisdom, and also work along with media, uh, I'm part of indigenous media, so we promote our wisdom there. And I'm part of the virtual um, library, uh, part of um, Biblioteca Virtual del South from Pajo. Uh, we are getting there together different uh, testimonies, different academic postures, lectures, and ministries, different documents that show us this an integral health and take care of each of us in communities. And also Dr. Ernesto Guevara, he has showed us and said, if we want to have health, the first illness we must eradicate is social injustice. And also Dr. Salvador Allende, he showed us the way that being a revolutionary is part of defending life, of transforming on justice and oppression systems in, in to go beyond uh, this to promote freedom, dignity, respect, to promote the respect of whole life. And I'm part of a people's health movement and there we get together Association of Latin America Social Medicine, also part of United Network for Universities in Brazil. Um, now we are having our uh, World Health Assembly in December in Cali. If you want to join, please come by because we defend health is a human right, not a merchandise and we need to unite. Otherwise, scientifics one side, social movements another side, politicians another side, and we are not getting together things and our communities are suffering. That's why we need to struggle all together because we know we belong together. We belong to Mother Earth. We belong to the struggles, historical struggles that made our, um, May, may the res gain respect for ourselves. That's why we give offerings, flowers, food, uh, and medicine. She comes from other Mother Earth. Everything comes from Mother Earth. And that's why I want to leave you with this, um, with this message. And this now I have uh, turned on this beautiful sacred fire, just to remember that we come from ancient struggle and in the name of our beloved grandfathers, grandmothers, we need to take care of life now. We need to take decisions now. We need to pass this through threat, threat of life to the next generation. They also deserve life, dignity, happiness, respect. And when we talk about uh, climate uh, change and we talk about the solutions that we can give, it's now we need to get together and network together uh, in that way, remembering that we are all, we all belong together, no matter my color, skin, my language, we all belong to uh, the spirit of life. Thank you so much to Columbia University for giving me the chance to speak up, to share. We know that we need to resist. We know that our hard times, war times, climate crisis, health crisis, but we also have the answers in the most simple ones, in the ones taking care of life every day. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias, Vivian, Vivian por... Thank you so much, Vivian, for your presentation and your participation, really. Well, now we continue with the presentation by Dr. John Barros. He's going to tell us about the protection of the most vulnerable in the United States and from the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. He is the interim director of the new Office of Climate Change and Health Equity in the Under Secretary of the Health Services Secretary in the US. He is a doctor with over 25 years of experience who works in the implications of climate change for health. He has been director of the 
Health uh, Department and co-president in the Climate Change and Human Health Department for Research on Climate Health in the US since joining the federal government in 2009. Before this, he was the main advisor on public health for the National Health uh, Environmental Health Sciences. Thank you so much. I give you the floor. Gracias, doctora, and buenos días a todos. Thank you, doctor. Bonjour a tous. Good morning, everyone. And I everyone. should probably add bon dia. Um, what two amazing bon presentations dia, to también. follow. I'm very moved by, by the one before me and, and completely uphold. Uh, I don't have a, 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 a light to uphold in the same beautiful way, but uh, uphold the messages of, of solidarity, of, of collaboration, of, of embracing and valuing the spirit of life and uh, adding to that the values of dignity and respect and, and the right to health. Thank, thank you for those amazing presentations. What I'm going to do in, in my 15 minutes is to show how we are trying to translate many of these concepts in, in a setting in the United States um, in, in a very new and unique way uh, in, this, in, in the context of our office, which has been created to try to implement the protection of those most vulnerable in the United States, its territories, and um, all people living uh, in, in, in the uh, United States um, throughout all of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and so let me bring my slides up, and um, I will talk uh, as slowly as I can while going as quickly as I can so that all of our speakers have enough time to give their presentations. Um, so so uh, Dr. Um, Varan started with a, a fabulous overview of how climate change is compounding other impacts, other injustices, environmental injustices, social injustices that all accumulate all add up to create the health disparities in all of our countries. These are just four images of ways in which climate change worsened bad weather and bad events like climate change strengthened hurricanes uh, in the Gulf, the wildfires that have been devastating the western states and the western parts of Canada, um, the, the extreme precipitation events and flooding and the heat waves uh, associated with, with sh shutdowns of the power grids. Um, all of these, I want to just make the point that all of these phenomena that we are seeing absolutely affect the health of people and absolutely have a greater impact on people who have low incomes, who are recent immigrants, who have low language proficiency, who have inadequate housing. Um, all of these phenomena have differential impacts on those people. But what I, one of the things I want to talk about is that these phenomena also have differential impacts or have impacts on the healthcare system itself. And that part of protecting those who are most vulnerable in our countries has to be ensuring the resilience of the parts of the healthcare system that are our safety nets, that are responsible for the health and well being of those most vulnerable. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. This is one of the frameworks that Carlos showed. I choose it for two reasons. One is that, as he emphasized so beautifully and clearly, the impacts of climate change are additive. They are force multipliers, is the word he used and that we hear a lot. They combine as their own social determinant of health. Climate change itself is a social determinant of health in addition to poverty, low education, domestic violence, uh, food insecurity, energy insecurity. And so this, this image shows how the climate impacts at, at the um, community level, at the individual level, compound and, and add up to create um, greater risks for people who have historical and current deprivation, lack of adequate um, support, adequate income, adequate social standing, et cetera. But the other reason that I show this 
and I want to emphasize this very strongly, is that it's not that the, the impacts of climate change on our most uh, fragile or, or disadvantaged or traumatized um, citizens in, in, and people in our countries, um, it is, it's not just uh, dengue, it's not just heat stress, it's not just worsened asthma, it's also worsened mental well-being overwhelming stress because of these cumulative stressors, anxiety, depression, and that gets translated into phenomena like substance abuse, suicidality, severe mental illness. And we have an epidemic of this going on, certainly in the United States. Um, and it is, again, one of those impacts that cannot be um, separated from from the, the, the cumulative stresses um, uh, from climate change and other social injustices. And of course, uh, people in, in, in the tribal lands of, of North America, indigenous populations, the, 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 intric the intricate connection between the, the, the physical environment and the human well-being and human spirituality makes this doubly devastating uh, in some parts of the world for, for those people. This is a, a flowchart diagram, as, as Carlos said, so it shows boxes and arrows, but this is, comes from our CDC, and it's just another way of stating that environmental justice plays out through many different pathways, through um, inadequate housing, through disproportionate exposures to air pollution, through uh, the, the compounding effects of of social injustice, of discrimination, of historical and current traumatic treatment. Um, and that these phenomena, these, these drivers of Ill, uh, unequal um, uh, health, health impacts themselves have root causes. Uh, so, so this metaphor is a root cause. This metaphor is a tree, like the roots of a tree that start with the racism, with the historical and current disenfranchisement and as again, Carlos stated so clearly, unequal distribution of power is at that root. Um, I'm gonna just introduce another metaphor and I'm gonna talk about the upstream drivers. And again, just to make the case as Carlos was, that when we address health disparities by treatments, by drugs, by emergency room visits, those are band-aids. That is not the optimal place to be addressing and protecting people. The optimal place is at the roots. The optimal place is upstream in this river. Um, there's a lot on this slide. I just want to emphasize that what's in the river here, the upstream, the midstream, and the downstream. And again, that, that healthcare delivery, yes, it's extremely important, and we'll talk about this in a second, um, but that's the downstream impact. The midstream impact are those human services that provide um, uh, income support, that provide education, that provide childcare. Within the United States, I just want to to emphasize that one of the things happening with you know with the work of our office and bringing together all of the parts of our Department of Health and Human Services in the United States, healthcare delivery and human services are combined within our Department of Health and Human Services. And the human services side that provide nutrition support, that provide income support, that provide money to pay electricity bills or energy bills, um, they are a critical part of the protection of our most vulnerable populations from the impacts of climate change. And they are now working hand in hand with the healthcare facilities side. Um, so that's the context in which our Office of Climate Change and Health Equity was created. We were created by an act of, of President Biden when he came into office. It's formally known as Executive Order 14008, and it mandates the Department of Health and Human Services to create our office. That happened on August 31st, 2021. I can't tell you everything about our office in the time. I want to just show you some of what our office has put together um, that can be models um, or in some cases have been modeled on things going on in the Americas. So this is our climate and health outlook and we are not the first 
to do this. We are the first to do this for an area as big and as um, climatologically diverse and different as the United States, but the Caribbean Health Bulletin was the first, and they've been around for over five years. We take all, as all of the seasonal forecasts for heat, for precipitation, for wildfires, for hurricanes, and we put it in a context of health equity. Talk about the counties where those impacts are likely to occur in the next 30 to 90 days, and talk about the vulnerable populations in those communities, and then connect that with the resources available to health to help, I'm sorry. This is another image, it's a very busy slide, I apologize for it, but on the right, we're just blow, blowing up and, and showing the listing of the indicators that we are using to help point our public health departments, help point our emergency planning departments at the state and local level and the tribal level to the indicators of greater vulnerability. And it, they range from uh, people who have underlying medical conditions like heart disease or asthma, to people living in poverty or who have a high energy burden, to uh, people living uh, in areas with poor tree cover, um, or um, simple indicators of race, which is associated with uh, uh, higher rates of underlying uh, exposures, higher uh, exposure to stressors, higher rates of, of discrimination, et cetera. Our office has helped also worked with the CDC to create the Environmental Justice Index. And I, I just show this because of one thing, it, there's a lot of indicators there on the right. Again, they combine social vulnerability with disproportionate environmental burden. But our environmental justice indicator not only adds these, these uh, different ways in which environmental and social injustice contribute to bad health, but our index also incorporates direct measures of the pre-existing chronic disease burden with those five health outcome uh, surveillance data, the prevalence data, um, just as a model for all the countries to move to using actual disease burden data to pinpoint the areas of the country, the geospatial indicators of, of where these kinds of interventions to protect people need to be. With that, let me stop and ask the Zoom poll question. I seem to be the only one stopping and asking. I thought we were supposed to do that, but we have a question to, to a quick question to ask. And I guess I'll read it to address differences in climate vulnerability. It's essential to address social determinants of health and current and historical discrimination, true or false? And uh, again, I, I guess um, I don't want to hang too long. I think that the earlier talks have so eloquently uh, made this case. And thank you for voting on that. I'm going to see if I can keep going. Uh, I can't, but if I close, there we go. Now I can keep going. Oop, let me just try this. There we go. Um, so th this again, I apologize, it is a busy slide. Um, I want to make two points here. The first point is that our office has a very big mission. It is not only that first priority, which is to enhance the resilience of all people, but especially those most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change in the United States. Uh, priority two addresses this issue of upstream drivers and trying to improve the social determinants of health through climate actions. Don't have time to talk about that, but priority three, again, is the work that we are doing to work directly with the health sector in the United States on its sustainability and resilience. And uh, this is a picture on the top of the United States pledging to join the COP26, this was in Glasgow in, uh, two years ago, the COP26 health program now known as the Alliance for Transformative Action on Climate and Health. Um, we hope that all countries in, in, in the Americas will join that. Right now, there are only a few of us. Um, 
very quickly, our office operates through partnership. We are as yet very small. We are as yet not supported by a budget from our Congress in the United States, but we are working in close collaboration with other parts of HHS, especially with the federal health systems to move all the federal health systems towards resilience and sustainability. One of the ways we're doing this is to work directly with community health centers. Um, the community health centers are generally located in the neighborhoods where our most discriminated against and vulnerable populations are. And so we have a number of initiatives to support their capacity and to build their capacity to recognize the climate risks uh, of, of people in their neighborhoods and their catchments and to provide services. We're also working to, in, to provide them with inexpensive renewable energy sources, uh, including solar backup power to reduce the use of diesel backup, and also working with them to do this integrated um, provision of resources to the people they serve. So not just providing the healthcare delivery, but also the, the health, the human services, the financial support, the legal support to address um, all of the people's needs, not just the health needs, recognizing that those other needs for safe housing, for weatherization of their homes, um, are as important in addressing their health needs from climate change as healthcare delivery. And this all comes together in a concept that's um, being promoted in the United States, and I, I, I know in other countries of the world, of creating actual um, brick and mortar hubs that are community designed, community led, community um, directed, um, and supported by a mix of, of sources. Um, these exist, they're being set up in different parts of the United States. I had the privilege of visiting one in Baltimore last week. And it's, it's a, a community organization that can pull in the government resources, the financial support, the legal services. And what we're trying to do is to connect them with a local community health care delivery so that that becomes part of the resilience all year round in addressing social determinants of health and especially a place of refuge and service in a setting of a climate-related weather disaster. So with that, we'll close and go to our last uh, question. So uh, we, the question is, our Office of Climate Change and Health Equity is seeking to help protect the health of those most vulnerable in the United States to the health impacts of climate change by enhancing the resilience of what kind of, of health facility? The choices are outpatient surgical centers, academic medical centers, community health centers, and safety net hospitals. It's a little tricky because I didn't actually say this. And if I can change the background. Uh, Haley, tienes que activar. Ah, perfect. And there's the answer, and and the right C is the right answer, but also safety net hospitals. So so C and E, I think, are are, are the right answers here. There's a, a a QR code if you want to find out more about our office. And again, I thank you for being included in in this great session today. Muchísimas gracias, John. Thank you very much, John. We will surely look into more information on the web and we'll also upload your presentation. Thank you for that QR code. Thank you again. We're going to wrap up today with Gafika Cavieses' presentation. She's a midwife. She has uh, she's a doctorate in epidemiology from York University in England. She's also a social epidemiology director from the University of Chile. She's also a visiting professor at the Department of Sciences of the York University, member of the Alliance and Migration group of uh, within the world movements of for people's health. She's also a consultant in health equity, also a um, researcher 
of uh, the Aviala Aviala Network of Indigenous Communication. She's also working in health of immigration population on patients. She has uh, edited sev seven academic books. She has also participated in different research uh, projects in Chile and abroad, and she has also published more than 150 scientific documents. She will talk about the immigration uh, between Chile and Peru during the pandemic. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Haley. Thank you to Columbia University for organizing this course. For me, it's an honor to join you today and to share this knowledge with you. By recommendation of the organizers, I'm going to use my mother tongue, and this slides will also be in Spanish, but you have the chance to listen to the simultaneous interpretation in English if you need that. So today I'm going to talk about a particular case, which is the migration process between Chile, Bolivia and Peru during the pandemic. I work in investigation in health and immigration for around 15 years in Chile and in the region. And today I'm going to share with you a general outlook about a complex, dynamic, multinational and changing topic, which is migration and its relation with health. And also I'm going to talk about the importance of building resilient health systems within the framework of climate change. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the impacts of cl climate that are widening the health disparities in the Americas and worsening the results of health uh, for those who have social, physical, and economic challenges. The previous panelists have talked about this, but I will also like to emphasize on the perspective of equity in the health sector to reduce the causes and consequences of inequities in health. And in this particular session, I'm going to talk about social vulnerability that is uh, an important factor in the Latin American and Caribbean region, taking into account the case of the Chile-Peru-Bolivia Peru border during the pandemic uh, of COVID-19. I do this as a representative of the intercultural global health center which is an interdisciplinary center promoting high level research to understand the complexity of world health and to find perspectives from the south uh, global south there's an important distinction here when we start looking into the concept of vulnerability and it's important to distinguish the difference between human vulnerability, vulnerability, which means all of us who are inhabiting this beautiful uh, Patama Mother Earth planet, we are in constant change and we are interacting with our environment for self realization. We all share this intrinsic vulnerability as human beings, but not everyone shares social vulnerability, which affects certain uh, sectors of the population due to their house, work, uh, neighborhood conditions, which can be in uh, distributed in an uh, equal way. I would like to mention uh, a book uh, from a Spanish uh, writer who says that human vulnerability is a sort of natural lottery of human existence uh, that is intrinsic to the human being. However, when we talk about social vulnerability, it is related to something constructed by human beings in a context of injustice created by society. It is understood as a vulnerability which is structural that is persistent and is a historical that has been weaved by the human existence in this planet since its beginning but especially in this postmodern world due to a process of colonialism post-colonialism racism and 
a different structuring of the planet that have an impact on the design, the application of policies, economies, and also in the history of the world, which uh, puts people above others and have a different relationship of power. This is all related to social inequality. Like Ortega and Gasset says in his books on meditations, I am me and my children and if I and my circumstance and if I don't save it, I don't save myself. So here I'm going to discuss why it's important to discuss social vulnerability as a framework for our analysis first because it's a tool for the defense of protection of universal human rights. Uh, second, because it's a space for the recognition of people who have been deprived of their fundamental rights and that live in some type or multiple types of unprotected states, um, especially people uh, of African descent, for example, in the United States, um, that show their situation shows the different inequalities, for example, if they're a woman um, of a certain race, there's an intersection of vulnerabilities. As Carlos also mentioned, the risk of suffering prematurely from some diseases and dying earlier as well. It also um, has to do with promoting actions which is important to measure, report, prevent, control, and repair. Carlos, Vivian, and John, all of them mentioned uh, or, or touched on this from different perspectives. So if we take a perspective of injustice to prevent and to repair it, this mobilizes us to action. And in this few minutes, I'm going to discuss migration in the Chile, Peru and Bolivia border. And I'm going to briefly discuss migration flows in Latin America and the vulnerability risks. This is a map that shows Mexico and Central America. And the yellow large circles are people who leave these countries. And the smaller blue circles are people who go into these countries. So Mexico is the main corridor for migration movements, um, people leaving Central America trying to reach um, the United States and Canada. The large number of, of people are in transit. There's a political and symbolic border, but there's also a physical border. So a lot of people um, are not able to cross and they remain in Mexico. Um, most of the people uh, who attempt this are from Central America and South America, of course, but mostly from Guatemala and El Salvador who generate a migrating population every year that tries to reach North America. And this is uh, seen and considered as forced displacements of people. So climate change and human displacement as a new challenge for the healthcare systems in the world, but also, uh, also considering historic migration flows in our region. Uh, this uh, chart shows the, uh, for example, the Venezuelan exodus, more than 6.7 million people have left the country. Uh, 1.7 million have gone to Colombia. They go uh, mostly to Argentina or Brazil. And for decades, uh, Chile has been a country that um, had people leaving, for example, during the military dictatorship. And in the last few years, it has become more attractive to immigration. And Today, we have around 1 million eight, um, of, or estimated by the census, a million and a half people 
um, who are immigrants, a third of which are from Venezuela, then some from Haiti, Peru, Colombia. Most countries within the, the southern cone, so there's a, a south, south um, migrating pattern. There's a slightly increased number in Peru and Colombia in the last few decades. Before that, uh, Peru was the largest for over 100 years. And this ditch is the physical border between Peru, Chile, and Bolivia. This is the Atacama Desert, the most arid desert in the world. These black spots that you see in the picture are people who are crossing this desert, mostly coming in from Venezuela, but also from Ecuador and Peru, looking for better conditions in Chile. So this brings us to, to the importance of discussing international borders. The fact that there are political borders that are also physical and they can also be symbolic. And there are limits that separate different political entities. And there are areas where these entities exercise their uh, go political governance. There's also uh, nowhere lands sometimes between um, borders, and there are also sometimes consulates and embassies. Due to the SARS-CoV-2 um, border uh, crisis, many countries closed their borders. So what happened in this ditch that I showed you in Atacama, but also in the border between Ecuador and Peru, um, throughout the region, there was uh, borders were closed. And so in general, what is this? It has to do with restricting, restricting, I, I highlight this, the um, movement between in, across those borders. Um, and this, all of these visa or entry requirements changed and this already existed, but it was uh, triggered or intensified because of the pandemic. So the restrictions increased dramatically since the pandemic, especially uh, since uh, 2018, because uh, interest of people from surrounding countries um, to uh, come into Chile increased. This is the border that I'm discussing here. This is the north of Chile, Arica, Iquique, and this is Peru. And then on the right, we have Bolivia. This is the border that I want to focus on for this presentation. Uh, Colchane here in, in purple in, in this slide is a rural border area. And so when the borders were closed, uh, over 100,000 people came in. It's not a regular border crossing. And so we conducted a study in which Irene also took part because they're out of, of four borders. I, I know I'm short of time. I'm fighting against time because I was the last one in this presentation. So I'm going to very briefly show you that we did study to look at what happened with these people who came in the country from authorities and healthcare voices. We conducted visit and an ethnographic analysis. And so this was only interesting from the people who saw the greater number of people coming in, in healthcare services. And so I'm going to only mention some of the dimensions of our studies and we will present the final results in the future about the migration process and borders. The authorities discuss healthcare health problems, accidents, people who lost limbs and um, new migration flows. Uh, dehydration, broken bones, chronic illnesses that were uh, not cared for. Uh, as for access to health, there was disinformation, children coming into the country unaccompanied and 
because I don't have time, unfortunately, I can't discuss this, but there's also some state cost crisis. But the first alarm was from the civil society, and which was the first to respond. And this draws our attention to what happens regarding human rights and borders. A lot of people were mobilized because of the pandemic, but also because of climate change and they need health care. And so this also made us look at the right to reunification for families, the right to information, the bans on slavery, servitude and forced labor, the right to nationality, the right to a cultural identity, and of course the right to or uh, equal opportunities. And so we saw some things that need to be improved, such as access, the fact that prohibiting entry makes it so there are some irregular categories, uh, new irregular categories uh, emerge, some good practices to promote, we saw cooperational, uh, cooperation of international organizations, and we also saw that the civil society was there on the territory um, in the, as the first line of response. So we need to uh, reinforce this resilient, uh, increase the resilience of our healthcare systems, but also take into account migratory processes. And we need to deal with all of these issues with an intersectional approach, and we need to solve the persistent existing inequities and um, repair those as an urgent matter, as Vivian was saying. If you want to look at this study, we also have similar studies in this links showed in the screen, whoever wants this presentation uh, can have it. And I also invite you to um, get familiarized with Rechisam, our Chilean network of, of migration and health research, and also Lancet Migration for Latin America, which has worked for a few years advocating for inclusive uh, diversity respecting policies in Latin America and the Caribbean. And in closing, I show you this picture of Vicente, it's a, it's a pseudonym, uh, and they are creating uh, stories with children drawing their experience uh, in their migrating process. And this is him traveling in a truck, uh, looking at the, uh, at the uh, stars. And he also uh, tells us that someone an invisible monster stole his backpack. And thank you so much for your attention. It's been an honor. Thank you so much, Baltica. Thank you for staying within time. We are a bit delayed because we had four presentations today, but we wanted to take advantage of these four exceptional speakers so that you can learn from their experiences and expertise. So we're not going to have uh, questions um, today because of time, even though we have really interesting questions. But if you have materials to share, we're going to include that in the website. Um, there's one question that has been asked many times but um, it's uh, about that saying in Spanish, uh, you eat the pineapple, but I get a tummy ache. So a lot of people were having that um, question. Well, it's something that we say in Costa Rica, we say tummy, uh, in other places, they're going to have different place, different names for stomach. They say guagua, panza, it's and we have all different names okay so thank you so much i won't delay you any further thanks again and we'll stay in touch good afternoon